It is a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Darren Carberna. Caberna. Did I say that right? Caberna. Darren Caberna. And I'm so excited about this. You started a company um, called uh, AccelerateMyPractice.com, www.AccelerateMyPractice.com. Darren was raised on a farm in northern Wisconsin. He started his first business at 14 years of age. While in high school, he took his earnings and invested them in the stock market and was able to get through college in four years without any debt. He joined the National Ski Patrol at 17 years of age and then attended the University of Wisconsin, La Crosse, where he received his undergraduate degree in biology and chemistry. During college, he was determined to have a great job prior to graduating and accomplished this goal in March of his senior year by getting hired by Patterson Dental. He was sent to Dayton, Ohio to start learning the business of dentistry. While working full-time, Darren enrolled in graduate school to get his MBA. During his MBA work, he did consulting for companies as large as GE, as well as nonprofits such as We Care Arts. He completed his MBA in finance and marketing in two years. After having been in Ohio for seven years, he and his wife, Christine, moved to Woodland Park, Colorado, where he had to start his business over again with Patterson Dental. In a relatively short period of time, he was able to build it up so that he was a top sales representative within Colorado for Patterson Darren has three young boys, born in 2008, 10, and 12, which keep him active. As they get older, he's looking forward to many activities with them, skiing, snowboarding, hiking, camping, hunting, and other activities that they enjoy. Wanting to make a bigger impact on the lives of others, he decided, decided to start his own business coaching on the best business practices that he has accomplished with 15 years in the dental industry, along with his MBA. Now he's impacting the lives of both doctors and their staff all over the country, not only improving dental practices, but helping people achieve their dreams. If you would like to see how, attend a workshop. It will change your life. And uh, I hope someday we get that uh, workshop on uh, the dental town. That we can do. That would be awesome. We uh, The online CE, I, I just love it because uh, the, the kids can watch that on their iPhone, their iPad, their computer, uh, all that kind of stuff. But you know what? I always thought the... Um, the um, Patterson reps and the Burkhart and Benko and Shine. I mean, the, the, how many dental offices would you say the average in Patterson rep calls on? You know, probably around 80 to 100, maybe as high as 120, regardless of the distributor rep. And they're in the same area. So you just kind of see what works and what doesn't work. Whereas that dentist spends their whole life inside their own little bubble. And they, I mean, you can go into a medical dental building with eight dentists. And not one of those dentists has ever been in inside of the other dental offices. They've never had lunch with them. Some of these guys can't even pick that dentist out of a police lineup. And you get to see 100 offices. How, so how many offices do you think you've seen in your 15 years? You know, I, I wouldn't even know where to guess. It's got to be north of 1,000 by this point. And, you know, it does give you the ability to see best practices across the country across local geography, what works, what doesn't work. The, the amount of information a distributor rep actually can bring to a doctor is pretty, pretty amazing, and, and sadly, too many of them undervalue them. Oh, yeah, or, or, or they'll pay a dental assistant $20 an hour to flip through a catalog and save $0.12 cents on gauze. And what, what I like most, you know, when we started Dentaltown, um, it was the, in 1998, the Internet was supposed to be five Cs. It was supposed to be commerce, commercials, content, community, and uh, what was the other one? What was the other C? Connectivity. And about 20 other dental towns started, but they were all selling supplies. And I was the only one who started and said, screw supplies, I want a community. And for the same reason I wanted community is why I didn't do supplies. Because when my sales person would come in, um, I especially like the detailed reps, like a detail rep would come in on an endo file. And she'd sit there and tell me, well, which endodontist do you like? And I'd say, well, I, I think Brad Gettleman is, is amazing. Oh, well, he uses this file, and, and he used it because of this, and he does it like this file because of that. And they just I, – I knew the same reason they'd want to get on Dentaltown to get connected with their peers, that this rep coming in who's called on 100 offices was my only link to the outside world, and I, I thought that was very value-added. And uh, so, so share with us, what, what do you, why do you think some offices um, – do better than others and what is uh, your uh, Accelerate My Practice all about? You know, I think it's interesting to see how some practices in the same town can thrive and another one can struggle. And my favorite story I tell relative to that is, uh, you know, the small town Iowa. 
And, and in this small town, there's two doctors in town, and, and literally on the edge of town, in this one guy's office, you see 15 miles of cornfield before the next water tower. And you, know, you wander in there, you meet the doctor, you meet one doctor, and, and you talk to him a little bit, and before he goes to do a hygiene exam while he leaves, you know, look at his team, he'll be like, you know, I don't know why I bother, the economy sucks, patients only accept what's covered by insurance, and who knows what other thoughts are going through their head. They walk in, they do their exam, they walk back out, they look at their team, and they go, I told you so. Then you get Terry on the other side of town who has a completely different outlook on life, and he'll look at his team before he goes to do the exam and say, hey, you know, the economy's tougher than it used to be for sure, but our patients appreciate what we do for them, they appreciate the discount they get on insurance, He'll walk in, he'll present treatment, he'll walk back out, give his hygienist or his assistant a high five. And the question becomes, which one of those two's wrong? And I don't think either's wrong, I think they're both right. Life is a great big self-fulfilling prophecy, and it becomes what we expect it to become. And in those cases, if you walk in thinking the patient's only going to accept what's covered by insurance and that they don't have any extra money, yeah, odds are your your behavior and energy is going to impact the outcome. And so many struggle to understand that. And we're so full as, as, a, as a country. It's not just in dentistry, but as a country, there's so much stinking thinking going on these days, perpetuated in a lot of cases by the media because, you know, blood cells. And so it has, it influences people's thoughts before they ever walk in there to talk to a patient about dentistry, much less ideal dentistry and it impacts their level of success, and even more importantly, their level of fulfillment. So true, and that, that's what I love the most about lecturing around the world. I mean, you go to Singapore, there's no dental insurance in the entire country, and everybody buys their dentistry like they buy their iPhone, their cars, their houses, their vacations, and then when you try to explain dental insurance to Chinese and Brazilians, I mean, it's like, you're like well, why would your boss, I mean, if you, you, if you don't brush your teeth, and you drink Coke all day, why, why would your boss pay for the decay? I mean, it's almost like you're, you're being subsidized for, your, for not being able to disturb your plaque twice a day. I sure. mean, you're not disturbing your plaque and you're drinking sugar all day, and what, Obama's supposed to pay for it? Apparently so. Yeah, and, and I also think this EU thing that just happened, um, you know, where everybody in Europe's talking about how, you know, this is the unraveling of the EU and it's supposed to be this this really bad thing. I'm pretty sure the bad thing in Europe was World War One and World War Two, where 150 million people got mowed down by machine guns. And, um, you know, when people say that the American economy is so bad, I'm like, did you forget the Civil War when one in 30 Americans were killed? Did you forget World War One, World War Two, the Spanish influenza? And you really think there's a problem going on right now? It's just all in their head, isn't it? So much is. You know, I, I love using sports metaphors, and, you know, I love talking to people who play golf, and I'll often look at it and say, hey, imagine just for the sake of illustration, you get to go play, uh, you know, down in the Masters, right? And you do the pro-am, let's say, and you're at the 18th hole because we've all seen it, and I'm in the galley, they're waving, going, hey, Dr. Friend, Dr. Friend, don't shank it. What's going to happen? You're going to shank it right in my forehead. I guarantee it. <laughs> it's just the way the world works. It's the way the brain is wired and how neurology functions and works. Same if you're a mountain biker. If I'm riding down a single track trail and I see a hole in the trail or you know, a divot, a rut, a rut, a hole, whatever it is, and I start looking at it as I, as I ride up, what will happen? I will smoke the hole. And the same is true in business and in life. If I'm focused on why my patient won't accept treatment, they won't accept treatment. If I'm focused on why my marriage is going to fail, my marriage will fail. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I want to. So right now, when you talk to Americans, the the, the big evil Godzilla monster that's going to come kill everyone is corporate dentistry. I, I just keep uh, I just keep thinking to myself, if I was getting a service, say I'm getting, uh, say I had hair like you, and I was getting a haircut, what advantage would the barber have being part of a corporate chain of barber shops from here to California? If I was getting a mani pedi, that little girl doing my mani-pedi, what, what advantage would there be that she was part of a thousand chain mani-pedi store? Um, I, I, I always thought that in dentistry, the product was the dentist and the value added was my relationship, my connectivity with you. I mean, what, what, what's your view on corporate dentistry? Because some people think it's the end of dentistry. 
you know, I, I don't think it's going to be. I mean, is it going to have an influence and impact? Absolutely. Has Walmart had an impact on Target and on Kmart and on uh, other Sears, as an example? Yes, they have. Have they changed the game? Absolutely. Have they made it better for the consumer? You know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. It depends on your perspective. So will corporate dentistry have an impact? For sure it will. Is it going to destroy and end it? I don't think so. I mean, if I look at how, how Walmart's doing and how Nordstrom's is doing, Nordstrom's is doing surprisingly well. If you look at their returns or their sales here in the last two quarters, they've been off a bit. If you looked at them the previous five years, the worst economy since the Great Depression, since 2008, Nordstrom's has done very, very well in year-over-year -year sales, with the exception of just here in the last month, few months. So how is it I can go buy a pair of jeans at Walmart for 20 bucks, or I can go buy a pair of jeans at Nordstrom's for $300, and they're the, they're the same jeans, or jeans. You know, the other metaphor I always use is food. I can go to McDonald's and I can get 600 calories of food for about five bucks, or I can go out to a high-end steakhouse for, and get 600 calories of food for about 120 bucks. What's the difference? The difference is the experience. And I don't believe that the corporate model, at least right now, has the ability to give the patient an experience that they're going to cherish and remember forever. It just doesn't work that way. And the example I always use, and I'll, I'll try it with you, is what are, are you, I guess I should ask first, are you married? Uh, I'm not. I, uh, I, uh, I'm I divorced. How long ago? Forever ago? Um, when did I divorce your mother, Ryan? Uh, 2000, what is it, six, uh, 2005. Yeah. I met, I, met, I met my four boys' mother when they were 14 before high school started. We uh, uh, got married 10 years later and married 20. So I feel very successful because I, I made it 20 years before she fired me, but, uh, but single. Do you remember an anniversary that you had with her? Yes. What did you do? Well, I mostly only remember the uh, the fifth one because uh, I lectured uh, forty, probably I think thirty six to sixty four times a year during the whole twenty year marriage. But on our fifth year anniversary, I was looking at my schedule and I couldn't believe I had the weekend off. So I called my dad and my brother, and we booked a quick trip and we went to Alaska. We flew into Anchorage to go uh, um, halibut fishing and uh, salmon fishing. And it wasn't until I was in Alaska that she told me that the reason it was blocked is because it was our five-year anniversary. <laughs> this will be a bad example then. Okay, no, Ryan, I, Ryan, Ryan, have you been married? Maybe you should ask my son, Ryan. Ryan, have you been married? <laughs> you know, normally when I ask somebody about their anniversary, if they're still married, of course, you know, they share with me that they did this, they ate this, they went to this restaurant, they had the steak, they had this bottle of wine, I'll say, what was your wife wearing? They'll describe the dress, they'll describe everything, her hair, and then I'll say, hey, what did you have for dinner last Tuesday night? And they have no idea. And the reason why they remember what they did on their anniversary six months, five years ago is because it was an experience that had a different impact, again, on neurology, to where they remembered it. The other one was just a transaction. I just shoved some food in my face. I went about my day. Had no impact. There's no magic moment. There's no memory in it. There's no experience. Don't really care. And I think when we look at corporate dentistry, at least – from a general perspective, overgeneralizing, that the patient often feels like it's just a transaction. I go in, I get my tooth fixed, I walk out the door. But if I walk into a nice high-end dental office, man, I'm treated like a rock star. They remember my name, they ask me about my kids, they do all this stuff. I don't believe that that same experience happens in corporate dentistry because the turnover is too high. It's not that they're bad people, it's just they don't have this, they generally don't have some of the same staff long enough for them to ever build those relationships or the patient doesn't stay in the practice long enough to ever build the relationship to have an experience. You're right because the only thing I remember about any anniversary I had is I caught 20 salmon in, in Kenai Peninsula. I won't, uh, I won't provide advice as to what happened in your marriage. Hey, hey, did you, uh, when you got a job at Patterson, did Pete Frechette hire you? Pete himself did not. But I mean, did, did you, was he the CEO at the time? Did you ever meet Pete? I did. He was he was one of my uh, best friends and role models in all of dentistry. My oldest sister uh, is a Catholic nun right next in uh, in Lake Elmo. Oh, so when I would go visit her, I'd have to do business for four hours and one minute. So I'd fly to Minneapolis, St. Paul, and I'd spend four hours and one minute with either Pete Frechette, the CEO and founding father of Patterson, or I'd go over to 3M and uh, talk to their chemist 
And uh, I, I just thought Pete was an amazing guy. So, so what is the psychology that is holding back both patients and dentists? You know, it's, it's our mindset. You know, I, I believe, I get a lot of my training from Tony Robbins as one example. I read a lot of books, whether it's a Jim Rohn sort of thing, whether it's a Stephen Covey. But, and so much of this comes out of the same places. Napoleon Hill is another a big name in, in some of this research, way back turn of the century. And, and so much of it is, is our experience, you know, what we've, what we've experienced in life. And, you know, one of the things that I often will explain from a, a neurology perspective is we often see or hear something. And then people think that after we see or hear something, we feel something about it. Right? We have some emotional response or feeling, and then we take some sort of action. I think there's a step missing in the middle, and it's the story I tell myself about what I saw or heard. So as an example, and this is how I would explain racism, it's, and it's called the reticular activating system from a neurology perspective. So what often happens in this scenario is, you know, let's assume I'm raised somewhere, and, and so when I see someone who's in a hoodie who's walking down a dark alley, it gives me great anxiety because I was told that someone who dresses like that's trouble and they're going to mug me because I grew up in New York City back in the 70s and 80s. So I see or hear something, I, hear, I tell myself a story instantly. Automatically, I don't even realize it's happening and the story I tell myself is that that person's trouble, so I feel anxiety, I run for my life. And, and so this to me it becomes the explanation as to how we do things. Similarly, I walk into a dental office, and let's assume I had a traumatic event as a child, and I smell that, you know, that funny smell in the dental office that they all have. Instantly, it triggers me to this memory of my childhood, and I feel anxiety, and all I did was walk in and say hi to you. So we, what we have to understand about psychology is this story we tell ourselves greatly impacts how we feel and then how we behave. And what we can do is help decode that for people through questions. This is the, the basis of neurolinguistic programming, which I, I know you're familiar with because I've seen you interview other people about it. It's all about how do we interrupt those patterns of behavior, and the best way to do it is with questions. You know, I've seen doctors, I know at least one or two doctors right off the top of my head, that do a great job of, of decreasing the anxiety of patients without giving them nitrous or pills. They just start asking questions, and through asking those questions, you lower that threshold of anxiety, and the person starts to feel better, and you fast forward it six months a year, they don't need any medication to get dentistry done. So it's, it's all that sort of stuff of how do you unravel people's experience, shy of trying to be a shrink, which you can't in a practice with a patient or even with a doctor in my case, but we can ask subtle questions that will make a world of difference. And... My metaphor for that is I often use as an equilibration. You know, if I come into your practice, my jaw is all jacked up and it hurts terribly, and you say, Darren, you need an equilibration, what do you do? Do you mow down all the cusps, or do you just make subtle adjustments here, there, here, there, 30 micron adjustments, but they're in the exact right spots? So when we're communicating with a patient, with a team member in the office, if I'm the dentist, the words we use, the language we use, makes all the difference in the world. And if we're not careful and very, very purposeful in that language, it could be a positive experience or it could be a negative experience. It's hard to say. By the way, that funny smell you're talking about in the office, um, it's the dental assistant. <laughs> so, I know that for a fact. Uh, but so what I, what I see um, with dentists is um, most of them walk in there and say, well, Darren's got three kids. He don't, he don't have any money. He's trying to put food on the table. I'm just going to diagnose this one that's that's the worst one and then you go to the dentist in the in the same medical dental building and then that next guy says his mindset is well if i'm going to numb up your lower right i might as well fix everything in that quadrant and then you go down to the next one and that guy is like well you know if you're going to come in i mean darren's got three kids he, he's a busy guy i'm going to numb his whole mouth up and do it all at once and then some dentists say well you can't numb up both sides of the mouth and you go next door and there's an oral surgeon and he numbs up all four quadrants for all four wisdom teeth on 100% of all his patients for 40 years. So how, how does a dentist change their – how do they go through transformational change to see this to where it specifically affects, like, say, case acceptance or treatment planning? or um, And they have so many things are had, like, well, you're on Medicaid, so you don't have any money. Or you're retired. You're on a fixed income. I mean, they just got so many things in their head so that when it's all stuff. done that I'm not going to fix anything in your mouth. 
So many stories in our head. You know, I believe when it comes to change or transformation, people make changes for one or two reasons. To gain pleasure or avoid pain. Right? Think of the average patient. What is the absolute easiest case to get accepted in a dental practice when they walk in the door? Their face is blown up. They're in a great deal of pain. They want out of pain. Easy case to get accepted. The second easiest case to get accepted is the patient who walks in looking for a cosmetic makeover. I want you to redo my entire smile because I'm trying to gain pleasure. I want to look better so I can go chase people or so I can get a better job, whatever it might be. I'm trying to gain pleasure. What's the hardest case to get accepted? The patient who doesn't know they have any problem and you tell them they need $3,000 of work and they're shocked. So avoid pain or gain pleasure is, is the combination. And if we can hit both of those those circumstances when we're presenting treatment to a patient, they're more likely to say yes. Now, relative to a doctor, same thing. You know, I've, I met this doctor in, in Nebraska a couple years ago. The guy, sad story in some ways, 60 years old, $100,000 in his retirement, living in a condo. I mean, that's a tough circumstance. And so he sits down, we have a conversation, and, and he kind of jumps my case, right? What do you know? I, I think I had less gray hair back then. And he's like, you know, what do you know? You look like some young punk. How in the world can you help me? I've been doing dentistry 30 years. I said, with all due respect, sir, I believe you have one year of experience. You repeat it 29 times. And so I, I purposefully shocked him with, you know, what would be considered by many an insult and said, doctor, you went to dental school. I went to business school. I am certain if we put our heads together, we'll come up with a winning combination that's going to improve this circumstance. Because your health is starting to fail. He had shared with me that he was starting to have health issues. So now magically as he's starting to have health issues and he wants to have a retirement, he wants to have more discretionary spending himself, now I'm hitting him with pain and pleasure both. We got his undivided attention. So after I posed that question, I sat back and I let him stew in it for what seemed like five minutes, but I'm sure it was only like 20 seconds. His face started turning red. It looked like he was going to have a stroke or a heart attack or come across the desk and kill me. He finally calmed that down and said, you know, maybe you're right. Then what can we do about it? So, you know, the basis of NLP is, is how do you shock the neurologic system so you can get them to pause, so you can get their attention, get things to change. In marketing, what they do is we use either the word free or sex to do the same thing. In dentistry, what you do is you call it an anterior deprogrammer. It's all the same stuff, just in different circumstances. How is it an anterior programmer is, is what? Like free and... Well, no, an anterior deprogrammer is, you know better than me, I'm certain. You have it occluded down on one tooth. It sends back a nociceptive trigeminal inhibition, which then deprograms the nervous system from clenching all the time, and then you put them in some sort of a guard and you do an equilibration over time. But you first got to deprogram why they're bruxing. At least that's my understanding. Okay. Have dental school. So, so then what, what should a dentist uh, be thinking and doing to increase their case acceptance? I mean, what... What They need to stop x-raying the patient's wallets and start asking the patient what could help them. You know, one of my favorite questions to ask it, because a lot of times doctors are like, well, I don't want to be a pushy used car salesman with my patients. I'm like, well, first off, if I look at your unaccepted treatment, you know, my experience is unaccepted tre accepted treatments 45 to 55%, and I heard recently that you said it was 38%, I think you said. And so somewhere in that range. So there's a lot of undiagnosed, undi untreated dentistry walking out the door. And oftentimes what ends up happening is because of these examples we're giving, we're prejudging the patient. And so I'll look at a doctor and say, okay, so you've diagnosed all this treatment here. Are you being a used car salesman? Because you already diagnosed this. I'm not telling you how to diagnose. I'm not qualified to do that. I'm not a dentist. You've diagnosed all this. My job is to get this patient to say yes to treatment whatever this treatment is. And so it's interesting for me to be able to see how that works. And a great question any of your people could ask their patients that would have a transformative effect on this is, Darren, do me a favor. Tell me, if you were to rate your smile 1 to 10, what, rate, what score would you give it? 10 being amazing, perfect smiley, a Julia Roberts smile, a 10 being you can't eat corn on the cob. Where would you rate your smile? 
And I think what you'll probably hear is the vast majority of people will say six or seven unless they have bad teeth and they'll say two or three. So even someone who has a great smile will probably say six, seven, or eight. Very rarely will you hear someone say ten. Some will, but not most. And now all you have to do is ask one more question. What would make it a ten? And they're going to tell you exactly what you could do to improve their smile. You're not being a used car salesman. You just asked a question. Questions are the key. So if I lined up 100 dentists and I asked every one of them, what's the biggest problem you have in your office? What, what keeps you up at night? What, what, what gets you the most? Believe it or not, most of them will say staff issues. They'll say, my, my, you know, and, and you, you love them, but people, and you saw this in college where, you know, you're, you, you'd room with your best friend. The, the, the best way to destroy your best friend is to share a dorm with them. And after like a month, you're, you're trying to throw the guy out the window. And uh, so what, how, how does any of this or does any of this apply to uh, staff issues, dealing with Absolutely. team members? It's the exact same stuff. You know, what I'm always teaching people is you got to know your audience, right? If I'm talking about patients and how to interact with patients, I give – it's the same core of content but applied to a patient. The same core of content can be applied towards a team member. So, you know, let's assume we have a team member who's just constantly showing up late or maybe on time is late in your world. And, you know, my experience is people will perform to the level that you expect them to perform. If I expect and I'm okay with my team constantly showing up late, they will constantly show up late. But by contrast, if I have an expectation that, hey, we show up 15 minutes early for whatever reason, whatever 15 minutes early is, because of this, this, and this, all of a sudden, guess what they start to do if we hold them to that expectation? And you'll also notice that I said, because we do this. I find people don't buy into the vision of a doctor because they don't understand it. Sometimes they don't get why we do the things we do as leaders in business. And if we simply share with them why we do it, it becomes easy. You know, Simon Sinek wrote a great book uh, called Start With Why. And it's all about why we do what we do. And sharing that vision with people is very, very motivating. If they buy into your vision. If they don't, of course, it's a different story. And if you have a team that doesn't buy into your vision, you should maybe make some changes. Or else you're going to be constantly doing this. It's like having a wife that doesn't buy into why you're married. It doesn't work. So um, I don't – I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you about how does this apply to attract new patients in your dental office, even though um, – I kind of put new patients in the same category as heroin and crack and meth, cocaine and cigarettes because um, one, one of the problems, one, one of the reasons I'm I, um, not worried about corporate dentistry is because I've seen no evidence of anybody keeping their patients for life. I mean, if you meet a dentist who's been practicing 10 years, they still need new patients. 20 years, they still need – I mean, you, you can go to a dentist in a town of 5,000. And he's been there 40 years and say, well, what, what do you, what would solve your problems? Well, I need more new patients. Like, dude, you've gone through everyone in town and, and they'll spend 3% of collections on marketing, but they won't spend 3% on patient retention, on a loyalty program on, and you'll or say, acceptance. yeah, they'll, they'll say like, well, I'll say, well, you know, anxiety is big. Why don't you get nitrous oxide? Well, you know, there's no insurance code for it. And it doesn't, and, you know, there's no fee for it and it just raises my overhead. It's like, but then it'll turn around and say, well, what, what can I do for SEO marketing or should I do direct mail or should I do 1-800 dentists? It's like, so, so I don't, so, so new patients and, and plus on this corporate dentistry, I mean, God, like, like I got a guy across the street from me, Tom Mattern. I mean, him, he's crushing it. He's got a great staff. He's got great hygiene. I mean, that guy is hard to compete against. But the corporate dental chain, I mean, my God, it's a revolving door. I'd rather have 10 corporate dental offices across the street from me than Tom Mattern. You know what I mean? So I, I don't fear corporate. They, they, a lot of these corporates don't even keep their average dentist for one year. Tom's been across the street from me for 30 years. You know what I mean? That, uh, I'd, rather, I'd rather have corporate all day long. But how does all this apply to trying to get more new patients, because that's the drug. Everyone listening to you is a new patient drug addict, and they think it's going to cure all their problems. When, when if you go up uh, and see the Hoover Dam, I mean that little trickle of water coming down, and they stop it all, and that lake on Hoover Dam, you couldn't even swim across. And that's a business that stops the back door with the dam. And I don't care how little of water or how much water comes down. If you have a rock-solid dam back door, 
you know, it, you, you just can't, you know. So anyway, so so how does all this apply to new patients? Because that's the drug everybody listening to this podcast wants, wants more of. Well, I want to answer first by solving the drug problem, and then I'll answer the symptom if, if, you, if that's okay with you. What's interesting to me when you look at, uh, at this industry of marketing or consulting is, is everybody's pushing this new patient thing when they're on our side because they're in the marketing business as an example. And let's assume just for giggles, I'm a marketer and I promise you, I bring you a $30,000 marketing plan and I promise you 100 new patients a month. What am I really promising you? 100 new patients a month. So you think, what I'm really promising you is 100 phone calls. So let's assume just for giggles, your front desk is terrible at answering the phone and can't convert one of those phone calls to an actual patient in a chair. What did you get for your $30,000 marketing plan? Nothing. Scenario number two, she's amazing. She gets every patient scheduled, but they just cannot stand a bald dentist and don't buy any of your treatment that you present to them. What did you get for your $35,000 marketing plan? Nothing. Worst case scenario, she's amazing, schedules all the patients, you're incredible, every patient says yes to treatment, they come back, they complete it, they walk out with a big, beautiful smile, smiling ear to ear, and they forgot their proverbial checkbook. What did you get? A negative. Worse than nothing. So if we don't begin with the end in mind as to how this entire process works from A to B, it does not matter if we bring new patients in the door or if we spend money on marketing. It's a very, very flawed thought because we've not thought about, as you pointed out, how to retain them, how to get them to accept treatment, how to schedule them, how to get them to actually pay the bill. There's times I'll walk into a practice, I'll pull their data, and they have $100,000, $200,000 in AR. I'm like, my Lord, why are you worried about marketing? You need to get your patients to say, yes, and here's the checkbook. But to answer your question directly, I believe, for the sake of illustration, I could fill a practice overnight with skywriting. My evidence to prove that are Super Bowl ads. They're 15 to 30 seconds long. They cost millions and millions of dollars. But yet the content is so good that we actually have parties where we just watch the ads. I don't care about the football game. I turn it down. I wait for the commercials. And what do we talk about the next day? It's not often the game because usually the game sucks. It's the stinking ads. So how is it that these ads are so good that we actually have parties and it's become a national pastime? It's because the message is so good. And the challenge is when people think of marketing, especially dentists, what they think of is the delivery method of marketing. And that's one small component. You know, a Facebook ad, a pay-per-click, an SEO, that's great. I can make you number one on Google for the term dentist. But if the message is terrible on your website and there's no call to action and they can't find the phone number or the button to click schedule an appointment, what good does it do? Conversely, if I walk in from a clinical perspective and I have snaggle mouth, you in 10 seconds can look at me and see exactly what I'm going to look like when you're done with me. And then you reverse engineer it to today and then you call it phase one treatment, phase two treatment, phase three treatment that gets me there. But for some reason, from a business perspective, most dentists don't do this. They just go, I, I need to do SEO. And it makes no sense to me. It's not comprehensive. It's no different than the doctor that does single tooth dentistry versus the doctor that does ideal or comprehensive dentistry. And I think we have the same problem in the business side of dentistry is we fragmented how we do it. And there are some amazing people that are really, really good at marketing. But again, if we don't have a method to capture that revenue, keep the revenue, and have a profit in the practice, it doesn't matter. And how important, you know, you're talking about marketing, getting new patients, uh, diagnosing, treatment planning, case acceptance, collecting the money. Um, what about the hygiene department? How significant is that, do you think, in the overall success of a practice? Huge. So here's the metaphor I use there. I find the most, I'll be very curious to hear your thought on this. I find the most successful dentists I meet across this country prioritize their clinical philosophy in five areas. First and foremost is treating perio. Secondly is stopping decay. Thirdly is bite and alignment because those will cause the previous two. Fourthly is the joint and lastly is cosmetics. Would you agree with those by the way? Yeah. 
Now, from an outsider perspective, if I look at corporate dentistry, how do they appear to do it? Tons of marketing. They do it backwards. They start with cosmetics, and rarely do you see a treatment plan that has perio treatment on it, right? So my business philosophy is in five areas, too. First and foremost is cash flow. If cash flow is not healthy, you got a business fast. doesn't matter. Secondly, I look at your hygiene department. If you can't keep a patient in hygiene, you are always going to be asking me for new patients. Fourthly, I look at treating perio, or I'm sorry, thirdly, I look at treating perio because I believe it's important for the patient's health and I believe it's good for business. Fourthly, then, I look at case acceptance. And lastly, I look at marketing. And HR could be anywhere in there depending on what you have going on. And yet, when I look at some people in my space, how do they seem to do it? They start with marketing. They do it backwards. It doesn't make sense to me. Now, if you start a fresh scratch practice and you have no patients, we have to start with marketing, of course. But if you've been in practice 10 or 20 years, as you said earlier, and they're still asking you about new patients, you have a massive hole somewhere over here. We should really plug the hole before we try and do that. Or else we're just pouring money down a black hole. So what? So I'm I'm not saying this. Uh, I'm not saying this because I believe it. My my job is to ask questions that I think my homies are are thinking in their heads. But I I, I read this a lot on Dental Town. I hear it when I'm out there talking to dentists, and a lot of them say, you know what? Um, Eighty-two percent of the dentists are on PPOs, mm-hmm. and my my hygienist gets paid forty dollars an hour. The PPO gives me sixty dollars for a cleaning. And yeah, my hygienist is booked up two months in advance, and everybody says I should add another hygienist. But my God, I, I lose ten dollars on every PPO cleaning. Why do I want another hygienist? Well, the question I would ask there, looking at the distribution of reimbursement across this country, is, and I'm going from memory because I don't have the data in front of me. If I recall, forty-two percent of patients are cash patients. 48% of patients are insurance of some sort, and then we have about eight percent that are government, most likely, other, we'll call it. So what's interesting to me is, and if I were to ask a doctor, looking at PPOs, and if I go back 15 years or 10 years or whenever the PPO was invented, was the PPO better then than it is now? Or was in dental insurance 20 years ago better for the dental practice? Was it better for the practice 20 years ago than it is now? Absolutely, yes. Absolutely. So we, the insurance model, which is 48% of the market, has gotten worse and worse and worse. And yet for some reason, some people are like, oh, you've got to get on more PPOs. You've got to get on the list. And I'm thinking to myself, 42% of the patients are a cash patient and would pay cash if they walked in your door. And according to the ADA, roughly 50% of Americans haven't seen a dentist in two years. As a result of that, the government thinks in its infinite wisdom, we should passed this legislation called dental therapists to increase access to care for patients because these 42% of people don't have access to care. Well, they have access to care. They just don't want to pull out their credit card to pay for it because they'd rather buy an iPhone or take a cruise because that's more important. So when they're sitting next to you know Mickey Mouse and they smile, all you see is decay in their mouth. It's messed up priorities. So in my advice, I don't think I would be in a race to the bottom. I don't think I would get on every single PPO. I think I would spend some time trying to figure out how do I attract this 42% of Americans who would very much appreciate my level of service if I could offer it to them and make it affordable. Access to care to me is an affordability issue. Not an act that we can't get it. It's not even that I really can't afford it. It's just that I want to buy an iPhone. It comes back to consumer psychology. We well, you know a lot of dentists say, well, you know, I want to go down to a 45-minute cleaning. You know, that, that would be the ticket. And I'm saying, okay, so you're saying that to build a really big service in this, like a mani-pedi, you should just tell all the girls, just, just go twice as fast. That's really going to build your mani-pedi clientele. Or if you're going to do a massage, uh, instead of an hour massage, yeah, let's do a 45-minute. That'll really build your massage. I, 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 don't, I don't see how a service is a game of volume. Well, I also don't see how, because I remember about 10 years ago where they came out with, hey, you know, going to the gym for an hour workout, that's just too consuming. So we're going to show you the 30-minute workout. And then it was 12-minute abs. Then it was 7-minute <laughs> abs. And 7 minutes a day, I'll give you rock-solid abs like you had in high school. That's insanity. Faster is not the answer. It's just not. Higher quality is the answer, in my opinion. Because as you're doing a 45-minute profi, 
And I'll ask you, being the clinician, are we really doing a healthy mouth prophy, or are we doing something a disservice? And really, if we're doing this, and we do this repetitiously, repetitiously over time, does our patient end up with perio? Are we really solving their oral health problems? Or should we really be talking to them about what they really have going on in their mouth, which maybe is perio, maybe isn't perio, and, and getting them the proper diagnosis rather than doing hero prophies or bloody prophies and just trying to do them faster? So when you were saying earlier that during a Super Bowl, you know, um, you know, you're not watching the game, it's just for the Super Bowl ads. Is that from the scar tissue of growing up in Wisconsin, watching the Green Bay Packers all those years? Is I'm, that why you don't watch I the game anymore? Fan for sure. <laughs> I'm actually a, a big football fan as well, so I am the guy who watches the game. Uh, but I do enjoy the ads from a marketing perspective because I, I just I enjoy right. not right. only it, watching it, the ads but watching the people react to them because I'm a consummate people watcher, and I love to see what makes people tick and how they think and why they think this. So I can better unlock the mysteries of the brain as best I can in my little pea-sized brain. Okay, now now I want to switch gears completely. I, uh, we're uh, two-thirds through this podcast. I want to switch gears completely. Uh, you've seen hundreds. You've seen north of a thousand dental offices for oh, well over almost two decades. Um, you got an MBA, and the uh, the podcasters. Um, at, at a bare minimum, you're talking to about 8,000 dentists right now. That, that's, that's the minimum. So, so the high numbers are closer to 33,000. But whenever they email, they're usually about 20% are in school, junior, senior, or five years out. They're usually under 30. Mm -hmm. um, very few dentists over 30 even, either email me. In fact, you're hearing this, email, and you're over 30, email me, Howard at Dentaltown.com, and say, uh, I want to send you one email before I croaked and died. Uh, but so so I I want you to focus on these young kids, and they're they're um, either in dental school or they're working for corporate and they want to start their own practice. What advice would you give them? Would would you say urban rural? Would you say take PPO down? Um, they one of the biggest questions they always ask is I'm three hundred fifty thousand dollars in debt, and Patterson, who you work for, says I have to buy a hundred fifty thousand dollar Serac machine. I got to buy a hundred thousand dollar CBCT. Laser companies are saying, well, to treat your perio, you need a $100,000 laser. And they're like, Howard, three purchases. I just doubled my student loan debt from three fifty dollars to $700,000. Um, and then another question they ask, and sorry to throw so many questions at you, but um, should I start my own from scratch? Should I buy an existing? So take it away the last third and just talk to that kid who's working at Aspen Dental who has dreams at night of, of having their own practice. What would you tell that kid? I would start off, I'm a big believer in know the outcome you want, meaning tell me what you want your life to look like, lifestyle, where do you want to live? Because, you know, we could talk urban or, or, or suburban, and the question becomes, which one would you enjoy? Because if I put you in, let's assume just for giggles, I put you in rural Colorado, where I live, but you hate rural Colorado. You hate the fact you can't go to Nordstrom's. But man, you can make a ton of money. How happy will you ultimately be? And if you're not happy from a personal perspective, how good will you be at your job? Now, you did you move from Wisconsin? Because at that time in your life, you switched from cheese to medical marijuana. You, just, <laughs> you wanted to give up ch sharp cheddar cheese and it just get free stick. legal weed? Sure. It's so you're saying, you're saying go where you're going to be happy because that's going to really affect your mindset on Absolutely. everything. And, you know, the other thing about it is if you're, say, you're a city slicker and, and, and I put you out in rural somewhere, you're not going to be able to resonate with those people. You're not going to be able to mesh and get along well. So first and foremost, I would talk, tell me about your lifestyle. What kind of a life do you want to live? Where if you could close your eyes and land anywhere on this planet and make a living, where would it be? And what would your day look like every day? So once I figure out a geographic answer, then I like to ask people, what, tell me about income. Because, you know, a lot of times I'll meet, especially with the young doctors, and they're like, well, I want, I, you know, I got to make 150000 right out of school. Okay. And, and then they're like, and then I'm going to grow, and I'm going to grow, and I'm going to grow, and I'm going to grow. And I'm like, to what end? I'm like, well, what do you mean? Well, to what end? Because, you know, I could grow you to where you have a, a business where you make a million dollars personally, but you're divorced, your kids hate you, you haven't talked to your mom or your dad in 20 years, you're an alcoholic, you're thinking about smoking pot to take off the stress, and you don't have a happy life. 
you know, the greatest travesty in life in my mind is to be wildly successful and unfulfilled. And the greatest example, that's Robin Williams. I mean, here's a guy who set out to make everybody on this planet laugh. And he did. And he was so miserable, he committed suicide. So it doesn't matter how successful you are if you're unfulfilled. So we've got to be able to find a way to not only be successful financially, of course, but how can you be fulfilled? And that's where that lifestyle piece comes into it. So what would that look like for you? Do you want to work six days a week? Do you want to work four days a week? Do you want to have a family? Do you not want to have a family? And there's seasons in life. You know, right now I need to get out. I need to earn money. And I don't have a wife. I don't have kids. Great. Let's work six, seven days a week then if that's what you want. But let's not do it to the point of burnout to where you become an alcoholic or a drug addict or someone who's sucking on nitrous over lunch. Those aren't good things. So what happens often is we get myopic in our views. It's like the doctor's looking through his little you know, magnifiers, and all they see is this little itty-bitty world in front of them. And yet there's this whole big world that if we don't address when we're helping answer these questions, we miss the boat and we ultimately fail this person. So my question to the young doctors here is, describe to me your perfect life. Write it out. The hours, the lifestyle, the income, the employees, the size of practice, the type of dentistry. You know, back in my Patterson day, I was most of my business was in Colorado Springs at the time. And I'd meet young doctors who would come here and they'd say, hey, you know what, I'm told I need to go out to the east end of town. That's what the shine or whatever rep told me. And I would look at him and go, well, I don't know if that's right. And they'd look at me like, what are you talking about? I mean, two other reps already told me that. And I'd say, well, you know, let's understand this for a second. Let's assume for the sake of illustration, you're a full mouth rehab on every single patient who walks through the door. If I look at the demographics in that area you're talking about, the average age is 35 years old. The average income is $33,000 a year. They likely don't need your dentistry. They might not be able to afford your dentistry. Why would you want to go there? Now, by contrast, if you tell me the kind of practice you want to have, the kind of dentistry you want to do, the kind of patient you want to work on, I can find the ideal place for that. So I love Stephen Covey's habit, begin with the end in mind. Tell me what you want this to look like. And if it's seasonal, that's fine. You know, For the next five years, I want to be here. Then after that, I want to move. No problem. We can build a treatment plan. It's called phases. But if we don't know what it is that you ultimately want, the lifestyle you want, the income you want, the patients you want, the hours you want, how can we build you the proper answer? So I would ask all of those questions. And part of that would be, do you want to buy someone else's practice or do you want to start from scratch? If I look at a practice and I look in the charts and I see that all of these patients have had, forgive my term, patchwork dentistry, and, and I'm a comprehensive sort of guy, right out of school somehow. I'm a comprehensive sort of person who wants to fix everything at once. I had better be really good at perception management. Because otherwise the patients are going to run out of the practice going, this kid's just wanting to pay off his student debt. And they're going to leave. And now what did we get for the purchase of the practice? If that's what I want to do, I would be better off perhaps to start from scratch and build the practice I want versus trying to transform the practice that I'm buying. And again, I can't answer these obviously generically because the answer is going to vary on every person. But I think I would ask these sorts of questions of people to understand what their vision is. And then once we understand their vision, now we can, usually what will happen is they'll answer their own questions. You know, I love coaching versus consulting. I don't want to call my team a consulting company because in my experience, consultants, if I look at outside of dentistry, if I look at Fortune 500 consulting, they come in, they fix things, which is great. But what happens when they leave? Did anybody learn anything to retain something? Coaching, by contrast, and I'll use personal training as the metaphor, Do who lifts the weight, you or me? I tell you how much to lift, when to lift, what to lift, what way to lift it, what intensity to lift it. You actually do the hard work. And you get the benefit of the education in this case. So if I can teach you your business, teach you these, this thought pattern that you can then take to your employees, to your patients, and help them understand from a bigger level perspective what they might want in life, we can help them achieve it more quickly. And it becomes sustainable.
Because my experience is, sadly, a lot of the consulting work that gets done doesn't become sustainable. It's not because that consultant had bad ideas. They had great ideas. But the doctor didn't learn it. He just said, I, I'm not the problem. The team is. Fix them. I'm fine. And anytime someone says that, I know exactly what the problem is. So the same would be true here. Is, is I would want to understand for this young doctor, you know, what is it you need? And then secondly, what is it you want? And right now, coming out of school, I might need a job that pays me well because I've got a ton of student debt and I just can't afford to take on more or I don't have access to capital to even borrow more. So I have to take a job. So then it becomes which one of these corporate entities do I go to or do I go to a private practice and work as an associate? Good question. Is the doctor who's bringing you in as an associate of private practice, is he interested in your well-being or does he just want to hire you as a slave? Psychology comes into this success equation too. And you know, if you're going to be a slave at a corporate office, you might as well be a slave at a private practice. It might be even better because they might not dictate your treatment to you at least and you learn what you need to learn. So what do you want and what do you have to have right now? What's a non-negotiable? And then we can start to answer the questions as to where to go through this process. But I would begin with the end of mine. I want to ask another question, and I agree on the uh, personal trainers. It took me years before I could find a personal trainer that just wanted to go out and have breakfast at the IHOP every morning, um, but I found the one. Um, so many of these kids tell me honestly, they say, you know, I so want to stop, quit my associate and start my own, but the bottom line is I'm just scared. What would you, what would you tell that person that says? And then the, and they just keep thinking, well, won't I be better prepared if I just do another year? And then at the end of that year, they're like, well, just one more year. And then just, so how do you convince a kid to dive into the swimming pool instead of walking around it, staring at it for years? You know, the key to me, one of the things. And, and, let, and let, let me, one more caveat, because a lot of times when they're intellectually trying to fortify their fear, they'll, they'll say that they heard in school that you need to be an associate for a year. And then some will say, well, I've heard you need to be an associate for two years. It's, it's always a, a year. So let me specifically ask that. How many years do you think they have to do it before they dive into the swimming pool? Well, it depends. Do you have the chair side emotional competence to interact with a patient and your employees effectively? Secondly, do you have the hand skills to be able to be fast enough to be productive? If you don't have either of those, stay an associate. So you learn the skills. And if you're smart, take a course or get a mentor who can help you with these things so you can learn them, so you can develop either the hand skills to be quick enough. Because if it takes you three hours to do a crown in private practice, you're going to go broke. Okay, well, tell them. Um, so what, what are my homies going to find on your website, acceleratemypractice.com? What specifically are you doing for dentists? Do you ever work with um, you know associates that are trying to break out? What? What are they going to find on your website, and what exactly can you do for them? And, and if so, how do they contact you? I assume go to Accelerate My Practice or yep. email you, Darren, at AccelerateMyPractice.com. But what, what, what do you do? What's on that website, and what do you do for them? We're absolutely full service. We do everything from helping them market, helping them to uh, – establish a protocol for perio so they can have their hygienist treat it. We talk to them about consumer psychology so they can figure out how to compete with the iPhone. We teach them how to lead their team. We teach them how once they're successful, let's assume we grow someone. Our nationwide average last year was $364,000 of growth. Average people who hired us grew at least $364,000. So then the next question becomes, what do you do with that cash? And I learned that lesson the hard way. I had a client in St. Louis a number of years ago. The year before he hired me was his worst year of his career. The year he was with us was his best year of his career. It was a swing of $242,000. And at the end of the year, I said, you know, do you want to do another year? And Tim's like, you know, it's been an intense time. Let me take a break. Let's come back to this. So he said, call me in six months. I called him in six months. And, and I said, Tim, how are things going? He's like, well, mm, uh, that translated to me, uh, he pissed away all the money. And he had. He bought this, 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 and this. So he's just as broke as he was, but he was doing another quarter million dollars a year more. And what I learned in that moment is I achieved the, what I promised him I would do, which is grow his revenue, and I ultimately failed him because I didn't teach him how to be a steward of his success. So we're literally full service where we help people 
manage their success, get them to the success. We do everything. So I love uh, uh, to remember Accelerate My Practice. Just remember AMP. You know, get amped up. AMP, AMP, Accelerate My Practice. But I know my homies. I mean, I've, I've been a dentist 30 years, and they always think the silver bullet, you know, no pun intended, you're in Colorado, home of a Coors beer. The silver bullet is I'll build my practice. If I just got a laser, if I just got a CAD cam, if I just learned, you know, they always want to, they don't blink at buying a shiny object, um, laser, CAD cam, CBCT. But then when you say, well, you know, I, I think the best return is spend 50 grand on a consultant. And they're like, no, I, I mean, I, they'll even tell you. Dude, I was I was on honor roll all through school. I'm a smart guy. I don't I don't need a consultant. I need a laser. I'm smart. I need to learn how to bone graft. I mean, if I just if I only if I only switch to CAD CAM, I'd have a million dollar practice. So how do you get people to quit buying shiny objects and buy consulting? You know, if if you get the shiny object, how do you get the patient to say yes to that treatment? Because Throwing more stuff at the wall does not necessarily make it stick. We've got to figure out, in my opinion, I, I'm a big believer in what I call leveraged activities. What are the one or two things that I could do that would have a transformative impact on my business? And that varies, of course, from practice to practice. But to answer your question, it does you no good to get a new laser or to get a, a cone beam if you can't get the patient to say yes to the treatment that you use that tool for. And they think that if they put the shiny object in the corner, the patient will just say yes. And sadly, it's not so because the patient is distracted and they want to go buy another shiny thing themselves. Your patients are just as confused with shiny objects as the doctors are. And what we have to get good at is creating focus to get the patient to say yes to treatment. We just need to get the patient healthy. If we get the patient healthy, everything else solves the problem. And is there a time and place to get the shiny tool? Sure. But if we can't improve the acceptance rate from near 38% to 50% as an example, it does us no good. Okay, a, a big problem with um, the dentists listening to you right now, they're all alone. Um, almost everybody tells me the same thing. It's probably about 85% are commuting to work. The rest are on a treadmill, Stairmaster, whatever. They're all by themselves, and they're thinking in their head, um, how do I know if I need a consultant? Uh, how do I... Can you paint some scenarios of what uh, what is your average client? What, why why do people call? Obviously, you're in a sustainable business. Obviously, you've been servicing people for a long time, um, but they don't get to see all those phone calls coming in. They don't know the fingerprint of who's dialing you. So, talk about who who is listening that you would be a perfect fit for. Uh, well, our uh, our clients who see the biggest results are the people who are already driven and successful, because all we do is give them steroids and it just goes crazy. You know, do we enjoy being the hail mary for people? Yeah, it's it's very very rewarding. It's very challenging though too, because the person who's in the hail mary circumstance is already so deep in quicksand. It's hard to pull them out. Can we do it? Yes. Are we a hundred percent successful with those scenarios? Absolutely not. Because the, the problem, <laughs> what's funny is they think that we're going to come in with a magic wand, the shiny object, we're going to wave it over, it's going to solve their problems. And the challenge is they didn't get into this circumstance overnight, they're not going to get out of it overnight. I think the reason why many people don't hire consultants is because they realize they're going to have to work differently, and differently feels like harder or more work. And it may or it may not be, but... They're afraid of change. So back to your original question, the person who's walking around looking in the pool, fear has them paralyzed oftentimes. And any time we're making a decision from a place of fear, rarely are we making a good decision. Very rarely. We're usually making a short-term knee-jerk decision that likely will probably make matters even worse. So what we have to do in the psychology world, they call that a trigger. You're triggered by something. And you're so spun up and the stories in your head are so loud and they're screaming right now that we can't be reasonable or logical. We're very emotional beings and we try and justify things with reason and logic. So somehow we've got to deconstruct why that fear exists and help them understand why it is that they even have it. 
So to answer your question about who could be good, we have a great analysis tool on our website. They can go to, and if you click on any subsequent page, aside from our homepage, you'll see over on the right side, free analysis. You're going to have to pull data out of your practice management software in order to do the free analysis. It's not easy. It takes some work. But what it'll do is it'll tell you exactly where the challenges are in your practice and whether you hire our consulting company or some other one, it'll show you likely the results you can expect, or at least the results we feel comfortable offering. But I just want to say something to my homies. If you're big fans of this show, you know what I'm going to say right now, and that is whenever you talk to a consultant, you know, the, the average dentist does 750 a year collection, takes home uh, 174 Whenever you talk to a consultant and say, what is the average uh, revenue that your client's doing? Uh, they always have a number twice that much. So do you get it? The people that use consultants are going for it. And it, it's the same thing when you go to Continue Ed. you got half the room, all the dentists come alone to save money. And then the other half of the room, every row of tables is an entire office. The dentist, the receptionist, the hygienist, the whole staff, the spouse. And the people who bring their whole offices are doing twice as much money as the guys that all come by themselves to save money. The people that bring their whole offices to the staff, they've been on, like, like when I talk to many consultants and I've asked a couple of them, who was the best office you've ever seen? And I, I don't want to say his name because it embarrasses Jerome Smith in Lafayette, Louisiana, whenever I say his name. And, and you, but you talk to Jerome. Uh, he's uh, 10 years older than me. I'm 53. He's 63. He's had a different consultant come in his office every year. For 40 years. That's why he has the most Rolex watch running dental machine. And um, the, the, the best investment is always the consultant. It's not, I'm going to go down to an institute and learn TMJ, and I'm going to get CAD CAM, and I'm going to get a laser, and I'm going to fly all the way to Dominican Republic and learn how to bone graft implants. Uh, I want to ask you that, that last question. Of these successful offices that call you up, they're already amped up, and they're calling you and paying you to go even further. How many of them are just doing basic dentistry versus, you know, placing implants and zero? Zero they're what? All, they're all doing more advanced dentistry. They're all doing more advanced dentistry. All like, like what? Implants, ortho, cosmetics. They're all doing more than just putting an amalgam or repairing a broken tooth. They're doing comprehensive dentistry already. And, you know, to back up to your point you made a minute ago, one of the things I love doing in our live programs is often I will stand up, I'll pull a $20 bill out of my pocket, and I'll go, who would like $20? And, it, you know, three or four people raise their hand. And then I just sit there and I stare off like I'm hiring a kite, and I go, who would like $20? Twice as many hands go up. Who would like $20? More hands go up. Who would like $20? Three people stand up. Who would like $20? And finally, after I ask it six times, someone comes up, snatches the $20 out of my hand. The key in life, and certainly the key in success, is action. If all we do is sit around and look at the pool and wait for the perfect opportunity, the perfect economy, the perfect shiny object, it will never show up. Action is the key. And, and therefore, what I would suggest to any of your listeners is do something. Even if you do the wrong thing, you'll be better off than doing nothing and sitting still. And of all the if they're doing comprehensive dentistry, what specifically are they doing, and where can my homies go to learn that? I mean, what because you're you're practice management, MBA, business stuff. Where what what type of dentistry, and where do you think they're going to uh, learn that? You know, there's obviously a lot, a ton of people going down to the Scottsdale Center for their clinical training. Great environment there. There's been a lot of people who going out to Vegas for their training. There's a lot of people going down to Florida for their training. You know, anywhere where you're, you know, obviously all of them have slightly different occlusal philosophies, and, you know, I'm not qualified to debate that stuff as to what's right or wrong. But anywhere you go, if you go and learn comprehensive training, you're going to be way better off than if you don't know it. Way better off. All righty. Well, hey, um, Darren, and uh, once again, they can email you, Darren, D-A-R-R-E-N, at acceleratemypractice.com. Just remember AMP. Uh, do you uh, – um, is that – and then if they went to acceleratemypractice.com, they can fill out a survey uh, and then find out if they, they – 
they can do a, fr a free practice analysis on a Friday night in their home by themselves without having to talk to one of us. If they want more information, there's a whole bunch of downloadable resources to help you get going, you know, free of charge. And if ultimately you want to talk to someone on our team to better understand specifically how, what we might be able to do for you, we will build you for free for every town a treatment plan. And then you can either accept our treatment plan or not. It's up to you. But we will hand you a free treatment plan on how to grow your practice and get you to your dreams and goals. And this is dentistry uncensored, so the, the ugly, brutal question, what, what does this cost? Varies. You know, we have, we have prices from $5,000 to $100,000 depending on the scope of work. So I, it's a hard question to answer. It's like a patient calling you up going, hey, I broke my tooth. How much is it to fix it? Well, I don't know. Is it a two-surface filling? Is it a crown? Is it a root canal in a crown? Or is it an implant? Same thing applies here. I don't know how messed up your practice is versus this other person's practice, and the fee will likely be different. Okay, and one last question. i got to go to one overtime question, uh, if you don't mind. Can I ask you one overtime? Um, a, lot of, um, a lot of people are um, looking at buying a practice, and it's exactly opposite of what they want. Like, say it's a big PPO Medicaid Medicare practice. And they've gone out to Scottsdale Center, uh, they've gone out to Coise, Panky, Spear, LVI, and they have a totally different view of this product. What's easier, to buy that big old PPO Medicaid Medicare denture clinic and turn it into a practice or start from scratch? You know, it's an interesting question or conversation I just had with a doctor not too long ago out of Texas who was big Medicaid practice and wanting to switch. And my question to him was, is we can do this. One, there's a very certain structured way to do it, aside from just pulling the plug. That's not smart. And we, re we have a green screen studio. We shoot content for our clients all the time. So on YouTube, you'll see, uh, I think it's next week maybe, we're broadcasting that show on how to get off of a PPO or out of Medicaid. But it's a structured process to do it. And the million-dollar question I always ask a doctor is if we start to make this change, you have become wired neurologically to be busy, 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 busy. And when we start to make this change, you're not going to be running around with your hair on fire. My question is, are you emotionally prepared to actually have downtime? And everyone says, oh, man, that'd be great. It'd be awesome. Absolutely, I am. And then we start to do it. And I've learned the hard way that then they go, oh, I'm not busy. Therefore, I'm not profitable. I'm going to go broke. The world's coming unglued. And I'm like, no, no, no. Look at your actual collections. Look at your production per hour. Look at whatever metric you want to look at to validate and see that you're actually making more, but you're not having to kill yourself. So you've got to be emotionally prepared for that change and committed to it and understand that it's going to be a bumpy road. You know, it's kind of like going through marital counseling. If your marriage falls apart, you can walk away and think it's going to be easier, or you can do the hard thing, which is go to counseling and fix it, and that's not easy. It's bumpy. There's going to be highs. There's going to be lows. And in this process of getting out of Medicaid or off of PPOs, there will be highs and there will be lows. Are you emotionally prepared for that process to be able to handle it without losing your mind? And if you're not, I don't know if I'd make it. All right. Well, Darren, uh, seriously, uh, thank you for all that you've done for dentistry. Uh, uh, thank you so much for sharing an hour of your time with me and my homies today. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I think you're an amazing man. Well, I appreciate it so much. It's been my pleasure for sure. And uh, how old are your boys? Uh, one of them just turned eight. The other one turned seven, uh, no, six in August and then four. So eight, whatever. It just changed and it messed up my math. I Used had to a step five and four. Now it's eight, five, and four. Mine are, uh, mine are tw four boys, 27, 25, 23, and 21. And I know at your age with your boys, sometimes you, you're worried that they're growing up too quick. And I'm telling you, Every stage is a blast. I'm having more fun with my boys at 21, 23, 25, and 28 than I was when they were your age. But when I was your age, I was always so worried they were growing up too quick. And so good luck with those boys, buddy. I appreciate it so much. Look forward to chatting with you another time.